Okay, well, um, I want to welcome everybody that is here and um, welcome you to the Far Hill Speaker Series. It's a partnership between Wright Library and the Oakwood Historical Society. And if you are a regular attendee, um, you'll see some new faces today. Um, I am Elizabeth Schmidt uh, from Wright Library. And um, along with one of our new staff members, Chris Leininger, and we're going to be taking over the library side of the um, Far Hill Speaker Series. You may be used to seeing Brian Potts. He is still here at the library. He just has a new role um, as operations manager. So he is stepping away from the Far Hill Speaker Series, but you can still find him if you visit the library. And um, as for the Oakwood Historical Society, um, Donna Cooper is the new um, person on their side. Okay, well, first of all, um, as Elizabeth said, I'm Donna Cooper and I'm with the Oakwood Historical Society. And so on behalf of the Historical Society, I'd like, and the Wright Library, I'd like to welcome all of you to the first of the 2021 Far Hill Speaker Series. Um, I wanna thank Elizabeth and the Wright Library for being such wonderful partners in this speaker series. And as you can tell, she's the technical genius behind all of this. I just get to go along for the ride and arrange for the interesting speakers. And I also wanna take a couple seconds to thank those people who shared personal stories with us as they related to Esther Price and their growing up. And those stories were shared with her family. Um, our speaker will talk about a little bit about that, but uh, the, the family really appreciated hearing. So as we go through this, if you have any personal insights you'd like to share, please use the chat. We'd love to um, hear what you have to say. And I'm gonna do a very brief uh, commercial for the Historical Society. If you're interested in the stories, the artifacts, the environment that have made and continue to make Oakwood a very special, unique city, um, the Oakwood Historical Society provides a lot of opportunities to learn, to become engaged, and participate in making Oakwood history come alive. Um, go to the webpage for the Oakwood Historical Society or a Facebook page for more information. So now, without further ado, the really reason all of you are here is today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker and his topic, Chocolate and Esther Price. Jim Revelos is the purchasing manager, and prior to that, he was the quality manager for Esther Price Candies. Jim was, as he told me many times, fortunate enough to grow up in the candy business in Middletown, Ohio, and he has a food science degree from the Ohio State University. And so Jim is responsible for the Esther Price tradition and all of the quality chocolates that come from Esther Price. So I'm asking all of you to sit back, grab a piece of Esther Price chocolate candy, <laughs> and enjoy the story of Esther Price and how she started and grew her business. And Jim's gonna also share with us a, a video as well about chocolate making, um, so Jim's one of the best in the chocolate industry. So if you have any questions about the history of Esther Price, the woman, her company, or making chocolate, um, please feel free to ask him. And we're so delighted to have Jim join us. Thank you, Jim, for doing this. Well, thank you. Thank you, Donna. I'm You're very welcome. grateful for the opportunity to talk about uh, my favorite business, the candy business. And, and uh, like you said, I grew up in the candy business in Middletown. When my father's business closed in 1987, he went to work for Esther Price. He was the first one in the company to have a college degree. That's what I was told. His degree was in the dairy science. And, and but then when he passed away, uh, the owner at that time, Jim Day, asked me to join the company. And, and I was very grateful. I've been with Esther Price 13 years and, and I've kind of stepped up to give some of these public talks and, and um, well, but it's not about me, it's about Esther. I make the claim that Esther is the most famous woman ever born in Southwestern Ohio. Who is more famous? Considering that her name is, is emblazoned on hundreds of thousands of gold boxes, thousands of candy bars and flat bags, a small fleet of delivery trucks, shirts, jackets, hats, business cards, letterheads, billboards, ballpoint pens, and paychecks. Gee, you'll have to agree. Not bad for a junior high girl that liked to make fudge. Esther Roman, R-O-H-M-A-N, Esther Roman was born in 1904 in Hamilton on Dover Street in a house across from a paper mill. I don't know if, if you, this is a historical society. My father told me he was born in a house on Harrison Street, Middletown, but, but uh, Esther's father, John, was a Hamilton native and her mother, Ella Osberger, was from Middletown, coincidentally. And at a very young age, her family moved to Dayton because in that era, people moved to where the jobs were. And her father took a job with NCR. Uh, many of her summers were spent in the Hartwell section of Cincinnati, 
where her grandparents had a little grocery store. And she loved working as the little grocery store with the candy counter. And it was called the Empire. It was behind the candy counter that she developed her love for taking care of customers and selling candy. It really is true. And it was also at her grandparents' grocery store where she met her future husband, Ralph Price, who was an orphaned child placed with a large family in the neighborhood. That's another piece of history that doesn't happen anymore. And, and uh, Esther was educated at Dayton Public School. She's a Dayton Public School success story. And they took her to a key point in her life, learning how to make fudge in junior high home ec class. And, you know, I remember my sisters taking home ec. And when I was done with shop class in junior high, then they started making the boys take it. But I never took home ec. And, and, uh, but they taught her how to make fudge. And that's where the legend was born. She learned how to make fudge and got quite good at it. Many, any of you people that made fudge at home, you cook up a batch and, and typically you pour it in a cookie sheet. And when it cools down to the right point, you start to stir it. And, and that's the same process that we use to make our cream centers. It's the same, same uh, technology, believe it or not. It's a process that requires uh, good timing and good technique. Young Esther truly enjoyed sharing her fudge with her neighbors and friends. When her mother grew concerned about the cost of this newfound hobby, Esther would hide her fudge making activities by spreading perfume around the kitchen. And with the tough economic times of the early 1900s, this is going back quite a ways, the early 1900s, she quit high school to help support her family. And using the experience that she gained at her grandparents' grocery store, she got a job at McCrory's Five and Dime in downtown Dayton. I think you go back 10 years, you could still see where that McCrory's uh, sign was, I think on 3rd Street or 4th Street, something like that. But then for a little bit more money, she left McCrory's to go to work at Reich's. And my mother liked shopping at Reich's. And she still liked making fudge for her family and coworkers. And, but once the manager at Reich's got a hold of her fudge, he wanted to sell it in his store. So that was really her first uh, true retail outlet, selling fudge at Reich's. In, in 1924, Esther married Ralph Price. They said that after paying the preacher, they had $10 left. So they lived with Esther's parents. And she had twin girls in, in 1926. So to help make ends meet, she redoubled her efforts to make and sell fudge. Her Reich's friends also began to sell fudge to other businesses, including a doctor's office. And there was a doctor that said he wanted his fudge coated in chocolate wrapped in chocolate. So Esther, on her own, through trial and error, figured out how to do it. Now, in working with chocolate, it's not necessarily easy. It, chocolate has a, uh, a crystalline structure to the fat, the cocoa butter, and, and uh, you have to control the temperature just right. Otherwise, it, 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 and they call that process tempering. And most uh, candy factories in this day and age have automatic tempering units. And we have a couple European automatic tempering units, but she, she kept it in temper by hand, and it, it, uh, when it's in temper, perfectly balanced, it, it's, uh, it stays nice and shiny for many months at a time, it, and it, it, it has good mouthfeel. So it's amazing that she really figured that all out. But uh, once, she, once she started coating her fudge in chocolate, she couldn't keep up. The rest is history. And uh, she really, really was a woman ahead of her time. She negotiated by a house on Faber Street in Dayton. 1926, banks would not lend money to women. Women got the right to vote, I think, in 1921 or 20, something like that. And so she borrowed money from her family and friends. And this house on Faber Street uh, with three young children became her, her retail store and factory. And uh, one of your members, Mr. Askins, sent a wonderful uh, uh, email. I'll, and maybe I'll read it later, but I got to stay on track with my story. But he, he confirmed and clarified some of the issues of adding on to the house and making candy in the basement, all that stuff. Great, great uh, addition to the story. Um, so let's see, her, her candy business grew. And again, she borrowed money from, from her family and friends and she expanded into uh, expanding the porch. And uh, legend has it that when it was too hot, she made candy in the basement. According to Mr. Askins, they always made candy in the basement. I didn't know that. <laughs> But her, her business was on Faber Street for 30 years. And the store was so busy 
that the city of Dayton cited her three times for tractor problems, and it was probably Christmas, uh, Valentine's Day, and Easter. And in 1956, she bought a house on Wayne Avenue near downtown. I affectionately call that our world headquarters, 1709 Wayne Avenue. This larger house allowed them to expand their business. And if you go into our store, and if you kind of look at it as you're approaching it, it it's a factory built in and around and between two old houses. There's two stairways that go up to what used to be bedrooms. My office used to be a bedroom and a nice little fireplace in the conference room next door. It's really cool. And, and, uh, but that, that house on uh, 1709 Wayne Avenue allowed her to expand her production and she uh, acquired neighboring houses to expand parking. It really is amazing what they accomplished. But Esther's process of making fudge really is still the heart of, of our company. Our, our cream center is unique. It, it, nobody makes candy that way anymore. We sent product to Germany because somebody wanted to sell a piece of equipment to make it differently. And they were amazed. They can measure the, the particle size in microns and it was just so nice and smooth. And their equipment wouldn't work for us anyway because it just would have changed the nature of the product. So we still make it with these old fashioned cream beaters that you'll see in the, uh, in the video. They're like a round table probably maybe six, seven feet in diameter. And it, it would pour the batch into the cream beater and there's cold water circulating through it, takes the heat out of the batch. And then we start to stir it and it crystallizes. That's how, that's the same way of making fudge. And, and, and when, when we make fudge, we cook up the batch to maybe 243, 244 degrees. And we pour it onto a marble table and, clean marble table with steel bars around the perimeter so we pour it on the table and that marble takes the heat out of the batch and then at the right time we scrape it with a, uh, a just a flat scraper and, and it crystallizes and if you do that right the product turns out perfectly and that's what that's your taught everybody to do um, we have 12 cream beaters which are essentially scraped surface heat exchangers circa 1910 1910 and it's nice to think that we have a secret formula but in reality, we use lots of good ingredients followed by good timing and technique. And the recipes for caramels and cream centers are exactly the ones handed down by Esther many, many years ago. And we do our best to carry on the tradition and the technique. In 1976, Esther was ready to retire. So she sold her company to a couple of businessmen from Cincinnati, Jim Day and Ralph Schmidt. And, and Mr. Day passed away maybe six months ago. He was he was in his 90s. He was a wonderful man. He, he I love, I love, really love Jim. He's a one. We miss him, but he epitomized the, the phrase: "The harder you work, the luckier you get." And he was a hardworking man. He treated people very nice. Um, but believe it or not, we're the sixth largest gift box chocolate company in the country, and we ship products all over the world. Annually, we use about half a million pounds, 500,000 pounds of premium chocolate, um, and we sell almost 1 million boxes. On a good day, we can manufacture probably 15,000 pounds of candy. Uh, normally, we're routinely, we're selected as Ohio's best chocolate by Ohio Magazine, and we always win awards at the uh, Cincinnati Chocolate Festival. But my favorite part of the company is not the products, it's the customers, because everybody has their own Esther story, because we're a tradition for thousands of families, thousands and thousands of families, really. I remember uh, going to a University of Dayton basketball game, and I mentioned that I work at Esther Price. So that always is a, a, a nice uh, point of conversation. And the fellow said, you know, his mother's 96 years old, and she only wants two things for Christmas, a box of Esther Price candy and a Manhattan. <laughs> And my office overlooks the parking lot there on Wayne Avenue. And at holiday time, I can I can see a, the older generation walking in with their grandchildren, holding the hands, and there's big smiles on their faces. It's really cool. And uh, my father worked for Esther Price for many years, and we lived out of state. Actually, we ended up coming back to Ohio. So my dad would always send a box of chocolates to my wife for her birthday and for Valentine's Day. That became a nice tradition for my family as my kids got older you know they'd have to wait for mom to uh, pull that red ribbon and then uh, they, they learned what pieces they they enjoyed the most it was really fun and one one longtime customer told us that when she had a really bad day 
she would, quote, go to bed with Esther and take a large box of candy with her. One customer taught us a phrase, where do you hide your Esther Price? And I was giving one of these uh, Esther Price talks at a, um, at a senior center down in Cincinnati. And so a woman had a story and she said uh, she got some candy for her grandsons. And they ran up to her and they said, but grandma, we want the gold box. <laughs> I thought that was funny. And uh, one woman told me of her father who was struggling with Alzheimer's. So we tried to give him some nice gifts for Christmas. But the only gift that made him smile was a box of our dark chocolates. It turned out to be his last Christmas. So our box created a wonderful memory. And that's our specialty, making sweet memories for all of our customers. And um, I'm, I'm going to flip over to read Mr. Haskins uh, email because it's so it's just a wonderful piece of history. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Askins' first name is Bob. It says, I grew up at 1840 Father Street next door to the Ralph Price family. I recall an addition being built on the back of their home that provided an entrance directly into their basement. This is where Esther Price candy expanded from the family kitchen to a separate manufacturing operation. The front porch was enclosed to provide a sales location accessible from the driveway. A number of neighborhood women worked for us during the basement candy factory. We neighborhood kids could watch them through the basement window. I learned the code on top of each piece of candy and am still able to wow, friend, able to wow friends by telling them if a particular piece of candy is a peanut butter with a heart or a chocolate with a squiggly line or a caramel or cherry with a, with a circle. <laughs> Uh, my family and the Prices went to the same church until about 1949 when my parents switched to a different church. The Prices' twin daughters, Eileen and Evelyn, babysat for me on occasion and would visit my mom and dad to play the card game casino. They were about 15 years older than me. Jack, their brother, was always working on cars in the, in the single car Price garage. I remember he drove a 1908 as best I can remember, Maxwell to the neighborhood that he had restored to mint condition that was fire engine red. And once during World War II, my dad recounted that there was a big snowstorm around Christmas Eve, and Esther prevailed on him to, to use that car to deliver a trunk full of candy to employees at Ohio Bell in downtown Dayton. And, and his father, my dad, marveled that despite wartime rationing, Esther was always able to obtain ingredients needed to needed to make candy. That's a, I'd like to find out how that works. And the last time I saw Lester was at her book signing at the Books and Company in Kettering uh, Town and Country Shopping Center. And one of her daughters was with her. So I, I passed this email on to Don Otto. Don grew up in the candy business and he ended up becoming a, a policeman and worked in the prosecutor's office. And after 30 years for the city or the county, he um, came back to work for Esther Price, probably three or four more three to four years. He just retired, but he, he really loved that email. And uh, when we were talking about the difficulty of making uh, white chocolate covered cherries, white chocolate's more temperamental, it's hard to, to uh, keep the cherries from leaking. He said, well, grandma, when we'd roll them, we'd have a, we'd have a pan full of white chocolate right next to the ladies. So they, they'd dip them in there quickly. And then they, then they'd, so that would, so that would allow them to get another coat of, cho of white chocolate on the bottom. So he always, you know, used to, your grandma would do this, grandma would do that. It's, it's, you know, when you move to Dayton, if you think, yes, you don't really think that there was a woman that had children in the family, it's just kind of a name. But uh, um, when I go out and give these talks, people ask me, well, where do you get your ingredients? Well, believe it or not, the, the, in the U.S., Pennsylvania is a chocolate capital. It really is. There's, all the chocolate comes from uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we went to a candy convention in um, Lancaster, PA, and Lancaster County produces more milk than any county in the, in the country because there's all these chocolate factories in there. And believe it or not, 20% of the country's fluid milk supply goes into making milk chocolate. Can you believe that? 20% of the fluid milk. And uh, But anyway, the chocolate comes from Pennsylvania. Our corn, old fashioned corn syrup comes from the, the cargo plant on Needmore Road. Our cherries come from Michigan. Uh, pecans uh, usually come from Texas or Mexico. Peanut butter comes from Texas. 
Our almonds, you know, 95% of the world's almonds come from California. So we use California almonds, they're roasted in Ohio. Our cream comes from Oroville, Ohio. Sugar comes from Michigan. Butter comes from Wisconsin. And our boxes, our little gold boxes, they come from Piqua. So um, that's that's my story. And, and now if uh, Donna or Elizabeth can show the video, you'll really enjoy it. It shows the factory really well. It was 1926 when a young Esther Price and her family started making candy in their Dayton, Ohio home on Falver Avenue. What began as a simple way for the family to make ends meet gradually grew into one of the finest candy making operations in the world. After 30 years as a home business, Esther Price Candies grew so large it was moved to 1709 Wayne Avenue, where it remains today. Jim Day and his partners who purchased the company from Esther when she retired in 1976, improved production techniques to meet increasing demands for her premium chocolates. Today's owner, the Day family, still carefully follows Esther's original recipes for the homemade goodness and incredibly fresh flavor that went into the very first box Esther ever made. It's no surprise that Esther Price Candies was voted Ohio's best chocolate by readers of Ohio Magazine. Over the last 85 years, Esther Price Candy's retail stores have grown throughout the Dayton and Cincinnati areas. This tremendous success is a result of the personal commitment to quality that Esther Price had for her work, her employees, and above all, her candy. Her passion is described in a quote from her book. I was thrilled that I knew how to make candy. It seems as though it was just something given to me that I had to use. I just loved making the candy and seeing how it was going to turn out. I was thrilled every time I stirred a pan of candy. Esther always started her candy making using only the finest pure and natural ingredients in all her recipes. Nothing artificial and no preservatives. Only pure milk chocolate, real dairy fresh butter and cream, and the very best nuts, cherries, and peanut butter that money could buy. That is the Esther Price way. And that's the same way we make our candies today. Now let's take a look to see how candy is made inside her famous kitchens, beginning with the chocolate. We use over two tons of pure chocolate, both milk and dark, in a typical day making candy. Although at one time Esther used 50 pound blocks of chocolate, today 10 pound blocks are placed into melting vats before pumping through special insulated stainless steel tubes to the tempering unit. Here, the chocolate is kept to a steady and controlled 88 degrees. This process, called tempering, gives the chocolate an appealing color, sheen, texture, and stability. All very important characteristics for our premium quality chocolates. As the melted chocolate flows over the candy cream pieces, some of the natural candy flavor will pass into the coating. A distinct flavor profile for our chocolate develops with each pass. Something so special our customers can only describe the sensation as velvety smooth and perfectly balanced. No other chocolate will taste exactly like Esther's chocolate, a secret our customers love. But before this tempered chocolate coats the candy, the setters have to be made, which is the next step in our candy making tour. The small batches of cream for the setters are still cooked in copper kettles over gas-fired burners. Esther's unique buttercream, which she also called opera cream, is worked into a creamy smoothness through our special proprietary process. Esther created this recipe after deciding to leave out the chocolate for the centers. The smooth and velvety taste of an Esther Price opera cream is simply unmistakable, and it's one that keeps people coming back for more. One taste and you'll agree. I always tell my customers, that if you taste the candy, that you'll buy it. Yes, you can taste the difference. Savor a sample. Like the buttercream, Esther developed many other types of candies through a trial and error approach by adding new ingredients to the original buttercream recipe. Many of these variations are still made today, such as fruit, coconut, and peanut butter creams, just to name a few. Esther also used her experimental approach to teach herself, and then her workers, how to expertly master each candy-making step. She described her methods as doing everything by sight. Peanut butter creams are just one of the pieces still handcrafted the same way Esther taught her employees 
from her 50 years of making candy. Other handcrafted candies using buttercream are Esther's famous cordial cherries. These chocolates start by hand rolling the cream around succulent maraschino cherries. We also wrap maraschino cherries in fudge cream for chocolate covered cherries resembling a luscious black forest cake. Chocolate covered bourbon soaked cherries are a new creation recently introduced by the days and quickly becoming a customer favorite. Jim Day, our owner, had some fun advice on the best way to eat a bourbon cherry. To really enjoy a bourbon cherry, you put it in the microwave for about three seconds and this will enhance the flavor of the cherry and the chocolate and, uh, and then you eat it. <laughs> Esther loved chocolate covered cherries too and even named a book about her memories, Chocolate Covered Cherries. Discover your favorite cherry and make a special memory. Fudge and caramel pecans are also delicate hand operations. Caramel pecans start with real caramel made from scratch using fresh dairy butter and cream. The caramel is deposited onto trays which are covered with hand-selected fancy grade pecans. Finally, the caramel nut pieces are enrobed in rich, thick chocolate. Mmm! You may have heard these types of pieces referred to as turtles because of their shape. As you might guess, over time, Esther Price candies became so popular, help was needed for production to keep up. One way the Day family improved efficiency was by installing an extruder, or depositor, to automatically shape some of the cream centers. Besides speeding up production, this technique helped improve customer service for those desiring our most popular confections. Extruded cream is formed as it is pushed through a die, cut into bite-sized pieces, and placed on the conveyor belt in precisely spaced rows for an even chocolate coating. Now we're ready for the enrober, where all the centers we made earlier are drenched in chocolate. <laughs> this part will really make you hungry. All our candy pieces actually get two bottoms and two top coatings of chocolate. The cherries get a third bottom to help seal and prevent leaking of the natural juices that will form as the cherry's cream center liquefies. The candy centers are conveyed on a wire belt through a chocolate bottomer to apply the bottoms. Then they pass over cool plates to set the chocolate. Next, the centers pass under a flowing curtain of chocolate which applies the top two coatings. Very chocolatey. We're almost done making our chocolate cream filled pieces, but there's one more important step before cooling and packing. After the candy center is made and coated, each piece is identified by stringing another small stream of chocolate just on the top, creating a unique pattern for each type of center. This step is called stringing. This step is done mechanically for most pieces with adjustments made for each unique pattern just before entering the cooling tunnel. We still hand string the C on the cherries and the heart shape on the peanut butter creams, the same way Esther did. In her memoirs, these candy makers were referred to as stringers for adding these finishing marks to the tops of chocolates, or dippers if they hand coated the candy pieces, which is still how our nut barks are made. What tops your favorite piece of Esther Price chocolate? Our loyal customers boast about knowing all of these identifying marks on the tops of their favorite chocolate pieces. Now, a cooling tunnel finishes setting the chocolate. Finished pieces are removed from the conveyors and stored in a temperature-controlled environment for several days until each piece is an even temperature all the way through to the center. We're ready for that famous gold box. Welcome to the packing area, where our fine chocolates are still hand-packed by workers, wearing pink smocks made famous by renowned TV comedians Lucy Ricardo and Ethel Mertz from the 1950s, who struggled as novice candy packers with a runaway candy belt, eventually stuffing the chocolates into their mouths to keep up. <laughs> Unlike this hilarious episode, our packers have mastered the fine art of keeping up with a moving box as they each place several pieces of candy into designated sections of the box. But this step isn't as simple as their skill makes it seem. As we discovered earlier, Esther Price Candies still makes many handmade pieces. 
This means there's going to be some natural variation in size, requiring instantaneous adjustments by workers while packing to a set box weight. Let's learn a little more about what it really takes to be a good candy packer, starting first with Esther's stringent requirements. I came in to be interviewed in November. It was very cold out and I had not knew none of the rules. So I was a rookie. <laughs> and uh, so one of the girls went to get her, is down in the store, and she said, oh, let me feel your hands. And I'm like, oh, they're ice cold, I forgot my gloves. She said, good. And so I was pretty much hard. But she did ask me if I could tie, play the piano. Well, today candy packers don't need to be typists or play piano, but warm hands will melt the chocolate very quickly, as Esther learned from her own packing experience. Nimble and cool hands remain important. Many memories of Esther and how she wanted things done are still very much alive and practiced today. How did Esther decide what type of package to use for her candies? After experimenting with many different boxes and bow colors for the changing seasons, Esther decided that a classic gold box tied with the Christmas red ribbon always had a good look. So she adopted this package for everyday use. The gold box soon became synonymous with her homemade fine quality chocolates and the distinctive fresh taste Esther Price customers love. Today, as in the past, Careful hand packing gives us a chance to inspect each piece before it goes into your box. That's important to us because the first thing we always pack into a box of our candy is quality. A signature red ribbon on the box is the finishing touch for Esther Price chocolates as a reminder of the personal care taken to guarantee each piece contains all the homemade goodness and fresh taste that has made Esther Price famous. We appreciate your visiting with us today and touring our candy kitchen. Esther Price is still a family business today, made with love from our family to yours. We hope you enjoyed the tour and meeting the legendary lady who started it all and used to say, I think I lived on chocolate. Our founder, Esther Price, lived to be almost 90 years old before she passed away in 1994. Many family members live in the Dayton area along with loyal customers who still stop in to shop or share another story or two about Esther. Esther always appreciated her customers so much and left this inspiration. If you think you can do something with all your heart, nothing is impossible. All of you help me make that dream come true. Every day we're still making dreams come true, just like Esther. We're busy making good old-fashioned candy for people who enjoy great taste, homemade quality, and traditional value. People like you. Thanks for stopping by. Please come back and share a story or two of your own with us. Or check our website and visit us on Facebook. Okay, um, I think we'd like to open it up for questions now. Um, as I said, Bob Askins is here, so we might bring him up. I, I wanna um, ask a few questions first from the chat. What is the most popular type of chocolate, Jim? Well, Esther's signature piece was the, or is the chocolate covered cherry. I think over the years though, uh, the caramel pecan, you know, also known as a turtle. I, I think we sell more individual boxes of those now than, than uh, the chocolate covered cherries. But the biggest selling unit is a 16 ounce uh, assortment mixed uh, milk and dark chocolate. Great. And um, someone asked uh, I, I about see, the. I can see the questions there in, in the uh, chat area. Yeah, the chocolate covered potato chips. I think from what I understand, it was an idea that Mike Sells had and they ran a few just to kind of give to their employees, but then it then it kind of blossomed into a, a uh, bigger business. And, and so it's, it's really a nice partnership. They do make a wonderful potato chip and, and it's a unique product in that we have to put a lot of chocolate on it because 
the fat from the potato chip kind of migrates into the into the chocolate, which makes it good, but eventually it, it gets a little bit too soft. So we kind of consider there's probably a three or four month shelf life on those. So it's somewhat of a seasonal product. We probably, we will run out in July or June and then start making them again in September. When will they come out with dark chocolate pretzels? Well, we do have dark chocolate pretzel rods, I believe, and we have dark, uh, Caramel pretzel rod, which is a wonderful piece of candy, and, and uh, so if you come down to Wayne Avenue and ask for ask for Jim, I'll try to help you find some dark pretzels. Let's see. How do you get a job at Esther? Well, you'd have to come on and fly and and uh, show up every day. Packing the candy on the packing line is not easy. I think generally the women prefer working downstairs in the production area because they do different uh, tasks during the day, it's not as um, repetitive, but um, you know, we're a seasonal company, so many employees like that. Uh, we start up in August and shut down in April. And so they generally have summers off and, and take a layoff and then come back. Um, did Mr. Price work in her business or? I think, did I she think, work at the Wayne Avenue store? I think Ralph, her husband, he wasn't involved in the production part of the company, but he was involved in the, in the accounting and the money part. And, and uh, it's my understanding he used to carry a weapon because they had the uh, holdups every now and then when he'd go to the bank. And, and uh, let's see, another question. Do, do you sell more light or dark chocolate? Uh, predominantly milk. I, I buy the ingredients. A truckload of chocolate is 40,000 pounds and it's probably 25 milk and 15 dark. And, and uh, most of our customers like the milk, but some like the dark too. Can anybody, can people purchase the video that we just saw? Um, well, the, the excerpt from With I Love Lucy, that's we paid for that, so I can't give up that one. I'll have to find out. I really don't know. I think we've given them away in the past, and, and we'll have to make some more copies, and, and uh, I'll try to find out and let you know. Are any of Esther's children still alive and living in Dayton? Well, Don Otto's mother passed away probably about a year ago. I think she was the last uh, of her of Esther's children, but she has grandchildren that live in the area. Now, Don Otto... Uh, was was the son of one of, of one of Esther's twin daughters. I don't I can't remember the first name, and he went to Vandalia Butler High School. So there was a good sized handful of his high school buddies that got in at Esther Price. I think four of them, and and worked there 35 plus years. One of our employees, Lonnie Vanover, has been there 41 years, I think, and he's still going strong. And, and uh, so. Was um, Jim, was Esther involved in the business after 1976? Was she part of the business until she died? I think, I think she generally moved to Florida and, and um, wasn't that involved, to be honest with you. I know that, that um, uh, we tried, Jim Day and, and his partners at that time tried really hard to, to make the candy the same way. And, and, you know, Jim, Jim's background was uh, construction and, and they made some modifications to the, uh, to the building, which were really helpful, really uh, in, ingenious in many ways. The way we have the chocolate melters, because it's kind of a two story, um, you can service the melter from down below in the basement, but it comes all the way up into the, uh, into the first floor where we, where we loaded, where that little shot of the, in the video of putting a 10 pound block into the melter. We have a couple questions about tours, whether you give factory tours. Maybe tours. now it's different than normal, but. It's difficult to take too large a group through. Uh, if you know the owner, he can pull a few strings. <laughs> <laughs> I can maybe take one or two friends through, but we, we don't bring in large groups that much anymore. It's, it's, it's somewhat difficult. But the, um, video, the, the video really does show a lot. That was that was the reason we made it quite a few years ago. It, it shows you what we do pretty well. And um, the way we've shipped product, we've 
you know, uh, we ship it to Canada routinely and, and uh, it's a little bit more complicated to send it to Europe, but uh, our proximity to the Wright Pad Air Force Base has allowed uh, visitors of the base to take our candy back. And they say, this is just like the best Swiss and Belgian candy. Which is nice. Can I ask hey. a quick question? Sure. Just going back, because I, I did read the book. For the people oh, who have You're breaking up a little bit. Sorry. Um, the chocolate covered cherry book that, that Esther wrote. Can you explain, talk about what really motivated her to start in the candy business? I, I couldn't hear everything you said. You broke up. I'm sorry. Sorry. What did it take to get Esther started in the candy business? What motivated her? What motivated um, her? Let me do it as a cap. Okay, that's good. Um, and while she's doing that, Jim, I, there are a couple questions about the, um, the box color. Um, one person asked about what um, the history of the, the gold box. I think it was sort of addressed in the video. And another person said that they got a blue box and they um, asked about when you offer different color boxes or if you do. When we offer, I, 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 I couldn't, you, your mask makes it harder for me to understand. Sorry, sorry. Um, one person says they got a blue box. Yeah, es Esther made some different colored boxes periodically. We, we kept some of the samples. I'm not really sure what it was for. The foil is, is uh, expensive. The, you know, if you look at our box, it's an embossed foil made by one particular company up in Boston, Massachusetts. They run it one time a year and it's difficult to be um, printed upon. It, we you consume a lot of the sheets to get it finally to run right. So we haven't really done any uh, anything but gold for quite a few years, but we do have the red for the um, bourbon cherries. And that's a hot stamp uh, process to put that uh, identification on that box. It's not the same. And another question, Jack Price had a pool in his backyard here in Beaver Creek. No, that wasn't Jack, that was a Jim Day. That, that pool is still around, Jim Day. You can, if you work hard online, you can probably find a photo where he made mosaic tile in his indoor pool to make it look like a box of Esther Price. It's pretty slick. And, and he was real proud of that. He was a great contractor. Well, there's somebody who says, oh, Jamie Williams, is that the Jamie Williams from Miami Valley Packaging? I hope so. And, and, uh, as far as Esther making candy at such a young age, it was junior high home ec class that really got her turned on to it. You know, she, she really had an affinity for making it. Kind of like like uh, somebody learning how to work on cars when they were kids and just making a career. Um, one question: Did Kroger ever own the business? No. From I was told though that Kroger was a player in in a potential buyer when Esther was selling it, and and uh, but it didn't work out. Um, any plans for a centennial celebration of the founding of the company? We did try to have some plans, but COVID has thrown a big kink in that. Um, that would be nice, you know, to try to welcome back. You know, one of the reasons I'm willing to go out and talk to the public is because the public has been good to Esther Price. You know, you guys have earned a little entertainment and, and uh, education about how we how we make our product. Uh, a new video probably would be nice. It, it seems like it's always it's, this video is already ten years old. I remember when they. When they, my wife actually is the one that wrote the script, working with the videographer. And, and, uh, so it's been fun. I hope hopefully there's a few more questions. Any ingredient questions or manufacturing questions? Um, I want to. Um, we'll wait for questions, but while we're doing that, I want to invite um, Bob Askins if you're still here and you would like to um, speak. I want to invite you to do that. So if you could just uh, find you here. Uh, I really couldn't understand your question. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Um, which countries in the chocolate do you grow in? Well, the best cocoa beans are grown closer to the equator, the better. The, 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 the premium cocoa beans come from West Africa. 
and they're harvested in, in um, and they harvest the, the pod and they manually split the pod and, and, and uh, remove the beans. They put them on the ground to cover them with banana leaves from what I understand and they, they naturally ferment and then eventually they're dried and shipped to uh, markets in, in Europe and, and the US. So they're shipped in big, big bag, burlap bags of uh, bean, uh, cocoa beans. They all come from, from um, West Africa. And, and uh, you know, there's some of the questions I get because they throw these questions at me is uh, fair trade, fair trade beans, fair trade chocolate. Uh, fair trade, in my definition, is when, when a buyer is willing to pay a premium as long as a seller meets certain conditions like child labor and forced labor and things like that, you know, and in a, in a world economy that can happen on any, any product, not just cocoa. And, and um, it's in the best interest of the uh, cocoa companies like, like Cargill and Blommer and Barry Calibo uh, to take care of the farmers. And, and, uh, and uh, so we pay a premium knowing that our chocolate supplier pays that premium to the uh, farmer to to not allow child labor. That's that's one uh, one good answer that I get. And uh, do the employees sign an agreement not to share them? No, we don't have any. You saw the video of making candy. That's what we do. I know we use that phrase proprietary process, but it's really not proprietary. You can buy cream beaters. The key to our product is just temperature control. To be honest with you, the way. The way that fudge, uh, the cream center cools, and when we start agitating it, and the little nuances that our operators do, that's what makes the candy unique. Uh, the busy season of the year is Christmas. Uh, we live and die for Christmas. We work really hard getting ready for Christmas. Valentine's Day is nice, Easter's nice. Uh, but Christmas, uh, we, we, it's, a, it's a wonderful gift, you know, for 16 bucks, you can go to Kroger, get a, a gift that's going to be well received by the re recipient. Uh, how do the cherries get the liquid center? Um, sugar goes, the, the cream center goes through a process they call sugar inversion, which is kind of the opposite of what you may see in when honey gets really old. It, it goes the other way, it crystallizes. And, and so when we, when we cook up a cream center, once it cools down to a certain point, it, we put one ounce of a, of a food enzyme called invertase. And that invertase with time uh, controls the sugar inversion where it, instead of going like honey where it becomes crystal, it goes the other way, it becomes liquid. And that, that's, that's all the cream centers go that route. And, uh, but eventually, you know, it, it, the shelf life is, is somewhat limited. So um, you have to, some people like them not that liquid. Some people like them really runny. You have to be, have to know what you want. Are all the recipes secret? Well, I don't think they're really secret, secret, but we use a lot of butter and we use a lot of evaporated milk. And, and uh, my father had the candy company in Middletown and we didn't use the, all the butter that Esther uses. And that's why our caramel is so good. Um, let's see. The Food Network talked about the difference between a wet and dry caramel. Um, I'm not sure what they mean. There's different ways to make caramel. Our caramel, the old-fashioned way, you, you saw the car, copper kettles, and we pour them on a slab. Um, and and uh, there's steel bars around the perimeter, and there's water, cool water circulating through. And that's slab caramel, and and uh, you can also uh, cook up a batch and put put it in the tub, let it cool overnight, and then you extrude it, forcing it through through a, a die, and and uh, that changes the structure of the the way the mouth feels a little bit. But ours is a slab caramel. Um, is it true that Reich's banned Esther from selling product? I don't know. <laughs> you got a lot of questions that are falling behind. Um, are there any products that you use to carry and discontinue due to changing taste? Well, there's a lot of people that have uh, gluten allergies. It's an honest to goodness allergy and a food allergy. My son, my, my middle son has, is allergic to tree nuts and ground nuts. And, and uh, so he has to really be careful. He's even allergic to buckwheat. 
we he bought a product that had a little bit of buckwheat in it. But anyway, um, we eliminated the malted milk crunch piece that went into the uh, assorted box because malt is it comes from uh, wheat. It's an extract of wheat, and and um, we don't make the claim gluten free, but by design that box doesn't have any gluten ingredients in it. Now we do have chocolate covered pretzels and we have um, uh, Oreo cookies that we coat. We have graham crackers. So those are the three sources of gluten, but a, a real gluten allergy means a person has uh, celiac disease. That's very, very destructive. So uh, we did remove that piece. Uh, our, no, let's see, uh, do you have an idea what's in, done online versus in store? Well, our website continues to grow like, like everybody else, uh, but there's, I like seeing people come to the store. You know, I get out of the car in the morning, I can smell caramel. And if you come to the store, you, you can smell it too, at least on Wayne Avenue. And our, our stores before COVID had always had free samples on the counter. We had tongs and you could help yourself. Now that this that display dish is behind the counter, so you, you have to ask. And those are blemished pieces that the ladies packing reject for cosmetic reasons. And, and that's a good way to get to know the candy. I, I just heard that several people couldn't get in. Oh, that's the your program. I don't know about that. Um, um, here's one. Is it true that Reich's banned Esther from selling her products? I don't know. I, I uh, I'd be surprised if if Mike if Reich can sell it, and make a little percentage on it. I, I uh, we sell, you know we try to focus on our big customer Kroger, but we sell at Meyer and some small grocery stores, we're making a concerted effort to sell candy at Kroger and Meyer in Columbus, and that's helped. And, and uh, there's a question about the old car display on Wayne Avenue. Now, see, I always thought that that was Jim Day and his partner, Ralph Smith, that were in, they were in the antique cars. But that window was started by uh, Esther's son that, that uh, was mentioned in the, what was his first name? Jack, he was a, he was a car guy. So he had his cars on display. And when Jim and Ralph took over the company, they loved antique cars and they would put one on display also. Now we've expanded our building. If you've driven by, we've given up that, that uh, window. So there's no more cars on display. Any other questions? This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for um, the opportunity to come and talk about my favorite business. <laughs> hey, Jim, just a few other questions. Um, with the, just a second. do you see the one in the chat? Yeah, the, let's see. Um, do you plan on expanding the distribution, say to Naples, Florida? It's tough to ship candy too far when it's warm, you know. Uh, we've, we've, in the past five years, we've gotten seasonally into Kroger in Indianapolis, and we tried in, uh, Nashville, but we had our struggles, uh, but just more of a regional company, honestly. We have some opportunities, but it's tough to, uh, to succeed at them. We have to be careful what we, what we try to buy, buy it off. Uh, what other, how old is Esther's company? Esther started in 1926, officially as a company. And, and uh, other collaborative efforts, we have a little bit of a partnership with uh, the local coffee company, Boston Stoker. Uh, we've developed a, um, a caramel pecan product with chopped up coffee beans in the caramel. And uh, I think that we'll be, we'll be selling that at the Boston Stoker stores probably in about a month. I know that the, the final design for the film has been uh, approved and it's waiting to be printed. Let's see. Um, it looks like our questions are kind of um, petering, petering out. We do have Bob Askins here. Bob, um, I don't know if you're still with us, but if you wanna say hello or share, share your memories. Yes, I am still here. And okay, yeah. uh, this is a very interesting presentation. Uh, stimulated a number of memories that uh, I didn't include in the uh, email that I sent, but uh, 
I don't know if they would be of great interest to the uh, larger audience, but it was kind of exciting at Halloween time when all the kids uh, got around to the Price House. <laughs> we got a lot more than a Clark bar from Mr. Price. What kind of stuff did she give out for Halloween? Well, she would just have uh, like two or three pieces of her candy wrapped up in a napkin with a ribbon on it. And they would just stick that in your, uh, in your collection bag. Thanks. Thank you. Bob. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Donna. No, that's all right. I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any other questions? When the uh, prices moved to Wayne Avenue, the family that purchased their house on Falver Avenue, and uh, Jim, it is Avenue rather than Street, by the way. Uh, the family that moved in was the uh, family of a man who was second in command of the Dayton Police Department. So the house had kind of an interesting residence history. There's two more Neat. questions that came in. Uh, roughly how many people work in the factory in the store? We're, seasonally, we're about maybe 110, 120 people. And, and, um, and then it drops down when we're out of season. Another question, uh, when did the place on Wayne Avenue start? Uh, Esther bought that in 1956. Great. Um, well, I want to thank you, Jim. Thank you very thank much, you, Jim. Elizabeth. Donna. Oh, uh, when, let's see. One more question. When did they stop selling cocoa? Oh, cocoa. I, bought, I wasn't aware that we sold cocoa. Uh, we buy a, a, a wonderful cocoa that my father used actually in his company. He's been around forever. Arist aristocrat from um, Birkins. And, and oh, the hot chocolate? We do sell the hot chocolate. Sometimes we, we, we may run out. And our hot chocolate product is actually a drinking chocolate to just ground dark chocolate. And you warm up milk and stir it in and drink it. Great. Well, Jim, um, thanks so much. We, we are recording the session today. So um, we just need to do a little bit of editing and um, we will have that up next week. I'll send an email out to all of the people who registered um, so you'll know when that's available. And um, thank okay, you, Donna, thank you. Thank Oakwood you. History. Everybody. And um, we'll see you, you. Um, next month. Next month yeah. is, uh, let me see here. We're going to have the Alphonse story. David Greer, the attorney, uh, being attorney, has written a book about a, one of the 1930s criminals who also had connections with a lot of the other um, criminals who made their way through Dayton on the crime corridor that went from Hamilton up to Lima, Ohio. And it's a fascinating kind of character study of this man who was born in Dayton, went all over the country uh, committing crimes, and now came back to Dayton. So I think it'll be a very, very interesting discussion. And that's at March uh, on March 21st, 21st at 2 o'clock. So Perfect. we hope to see some of you then. Thanks for coming.